welcome to the High Performance Podcast, Johanna Conter. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I mean, that was quite the introduction. I feel quite nervous. <laughs> ah, you'll be fine. You will be fine. Let's start as we always do. Yes. In your mind, what is high performance? In my mind, high performance is finding your own 1%. It's finding your own... The, the best that you can be within yourself. And that's regardless. So it's basically your own PB, really. It's regardless of, of who you're competing against, what what your job is, what what your passions are. It's 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 kind of honing in on on your your elite self. And I think elite doesn't just apply to sports men and women. It applies to every walk of life depending on what you do. I love the conversation about the extra one percent because it's it kind of reminds me that so many people go around thinking they're giving it their all but they haven't been opened up to this sort of extra 1%. Can you remember when you realised there was more to come, the difference between good and elite, the difference between the 1% and then the non-1%ers? Um, I think it's it's finding that combination between working hard but also working right. And I've, I've always been a hard worker. I've always... Um, understood that I needed to sacrifice. I needed to dedicate myself to to what I do and 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 give it my all to give it, you know to have the best shot at succeeding. Um, but I think sometimes with hard work can come tense tensity and it, you can become a bit paralysed. You can become a bit more stressed. And I think it's almost then understanding that you're doing the best that you can, but almost adding a bit of relaxation into there. And I think that's when you start opening yourself up to working the right way, both hard and applying yourself, but being productive. And, and actually, I think starting to build on, on what you build on to, to be successful. Now, you said really casually there, Joe, that I've always known that you have to work hard, you have to commit, as if that that's obvious to you but for a lot of people it isn't so how did you come to that realization um I think I think I was maybe quite fortunate with my upbringing um my dad's a bit of a workhorse and for as long as I can remember my dad's worked in the hospitality business and their you know holidays are not that simple they're every Christmas every Easter every every holiday he was working he was working long shifts long hours and so um you know, we'd get up extra early in the morning because I'd go with him to work before he then dropped me off at school. So I saw the kind of life that he lived and it was nonstop and it was hard work. And so I think um, I was maybe exposed to that quite early on. So when tennis came into the picture or my passion for tennis, I, I think I saw that as the blueprint for how I apply to my how I apply myself to what I do then. Um, so yeah, I think maybe, yeah, dad was a bit of an influence on that. <laughs> I, I'm sure I read somewhere that you were about nine years old, eight or nine years old and yes. you decided I'm just going to be the world number one tennis player. Yes. That's, a, that's quite <laughs> yes. a goal to set yourself at quite a young age. Like yeah. <laughs> my daughter's still not sure what she's going to be doing. Um, um so yeah. talk us through that. That's amazing. I mean, I think, I mean, it. I started playing, yeah, about eight years old. I was seven, eight years old. And um, I started playing because the school that I went to had after school care. There was a club right next door. They picked a, picked a group of us kids up, took us there. Mum and dad both worked full time, got babysat for, you know, a couple hours. And during that period, I started playing. I did enjoy it then. So I actually, I didn't like it. And, and to this day, when I ask mum and dad about it, they sometimes say, yeah, I would ask, do I have to go play? And they'd always say, well, no, but you'll you'll need to go do something else sport was always a big part of of our family and it, it was something that they wanted me to do for a hobby for physical education right. so that was that was staying um anyway i somehow still ended up going to play um but then mum and dad entered me into some weekend competitions like kind of at the club where i was practicing and and then I started to play and compete. And that's when I fell in love with it. And that's when I became hungry for it and kind of, oh, this is really good. And then I um, I think I've lost my train of thought there. What was your question? No, well, <laughs> you're exactly on it. I mean, I was saying, where did it come so, from? It well, sounds yeah, to me like what you're saying is it was actually, it wasn't the playing tennis that No, it was the you. competing. The competing. Mm. That no, is, for that sure. That is interesting. Yeah, no, definitely. Because it was, I think, what gave it purpose for me. Um, I think for me, training without purpose is a bit boring, tiring. Training's hard. It's painful. It's exhausting. And it, it, 
I, I'm not one of those people that necessarily might do it just for just for laughs, really. Um, so I think it gave that purpose of, oh, OK, I now need to go practice because I want to be better. And then suddenly, you know, became conversation around dad was like, OK, well, if you want to, you know, become good, then we need to go train. And I was like, OK, we'll go running every every morning, 5 a.m. Let's go running. And so before we he'd go to work and then drop me off at school, we'd always then start running. Um, and that was you driving that. that was, so your dad yes. was nurturing it, but that was you setting yes. that five Oh, dad was completely on board. I think I think I'm, I'm the son my dad never had. So he was fully on board <laughs> with like <laughs> me being um, all active and, and, and loving sports. So yeah, no, he, funny story though, at the start of our runs, there was this little hill yeah. and we'd always go around that big golf course. And this was when I, we were living in Sydney. And how old are you now? It's nine, 10. And how often is this happening? Uh, every morning, probably five times a week. Yeah, like school mornings. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure every morning. I'm a dad. And what time my... of the day? 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking about getting our kids out of, <laughs> out of bed for school. I'm right. loving it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. But we, we're running up this little hill and I remember dad always used to like, okay, we'll race up the hill. And I was like, okay. And I'd, I'd sometimes win, I'd sometimes lose, but you know, I was like running so hard. Only now, maybe a couple years ago, was I thinking of that. And I asked my dad, I'm like, there's no way a 10 year old girl beats her like 30 something, 40 something year old dad at sprints up a hill. I'm like, did you let me win? He's like, of course. I'm like, oh. I'm, like, I'm so betrayed. I'm like, I, my whole life's been a lie. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I still to this day think of that thinking, why did I think for a moment that actually a 10 year old girl can be a dad? And I really did. I thought and I what did. What were you thinking at five to five in the morning when you're having to climb out of bed? Like what was the, what was the end of goal at that point? Was it because you have, as you said, you don't enjoy training. So it wasn't going for the run that was like, woohoo. Yeah. I'm running. Um, to be honest, I don't remember all I remember now as an, as an adult is those are some of the best memories of my childhood. Um, just we'd always set the goal of running to the top of that golf course for sunrise. And for me, just having that kind of father daughter time, like spending that time with my dad running, like, you know, just that physical exertion, beautiful kind of sunrise, like something to aim for up there. It's honestly, it's some of my, my most fond childhood memories. So can I ask you then, Joe, like what was it that, that was lit in you? Was it the idea of beating other people or beating yourself that really lit a fire? To be honest, I don't know. Um, I don't know. And, and, I just remember even now, kind of again, as an adult thinking back on what that felt like to compete. I just remember being on court on, you know, the synthetic grass courts with like the sand on top. That's that's what I started to learn on. And I just I just see myself playing these matches and 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 trying and just trying hard. And at that point, I didn't understand the difference between trying hard and, and trying right kind of thing. Yeah. And I just remember just wanting to win and wanting to yeah, probably beat the other person and come out come out the victor. That's I think that's what fueled me. And what were your parents like if ever you said, oh, do you know what, I don't fancy getting up today. I don't fancy training today. I don't really want to take part in this weekend's tennis tournament. Um, whew, I don't know. I think, I mean, there were a couple times when I was a young girl actually where... Um, where I didn't want to do it. And I remember, I, I distinctly remember one competition and I must have been, I'd say maybe 10 or 11. And the night before I'd been at a friend's house, um, I had a sleepover and during the day I was playing in the pool and stuff and I think I was quite tired. And they were the ones that were taking me to this tournament and my dad was gonna come collect me at the end. And for whatever reason, I don't know, I can't remember, maybe because I was nervous about the match, maybe because I was tired, a combination of the two. I went on court and I I basically gave up the match. I said I felt ill, I said I, I had a stomach ache. And I remember my dad turned up, he took one look at me, he's like, you have no stomach ache, then you're done. Like, we'll stop playing right here. Because, you know, you don't just give up, you don't just, 
for no so and he yeah we got in the car went home I think he put my rackets away and I cried I cried I think for I mean to me it feels like days and days probably weeks it was probably like maybe an afternoon I don't know but for me it was like world ending yeah and I think I must have done convincing on my dad and must have just like please please give me another chance um but so obviously I started playing again. I don't remember that part, but I just remember that moment when I was a young girl on, on giving up and why I should never give up and why I should never just throw in the towel and, and kind of leave. And how vivid is that memory even now when you're playing on court at Wimbledon or in, uh, in New York? How vivid does that memory still? Um, it's not at the forefront yeah. of, my, of my mind. I, I understand the value and I know... Um, what it means to be struggling out there, but also know what good things can come in just staying there. So whether it's going right or wrong, just staying there, knowing things aren't permanent, knowing feeling stress or feeling anxiety or happiness or joy, anything, it's not permanent, nothing's a permanent state. So I think that as an adult, I think probably comes from, you know, learning that lesson of not giving in a towel because you never know what can happen when you stay there. Um, but yeah, that was, that was probably a shaping experience. <laughs> Definitely. So there's a fascinating line that you, again, you use there where you spoke about trying hard and then trying smart. Mm. So what age was it that you made that distinction in terms of if you were going to commit to tennis and competing and progressing? What age did you realise that you were going to have to go all in? I think I I realized that very early very early on, on about going all in. I think when I was about eight, nine years old, I decided, you know what, I love this. I want to be number one in the world. I want to win all four Grand Slams twice and I want to win a gold medal. Like And were you just encouraged at home? Great, go for that. That's the Yeah. I think I was encouraged to dream. I was encouraged to imagine something big for myself. Um but I was encouraged to do that through understanding that I would need to put in the work to be able to achieve that. Yeah. Um, so it was it was never just dream about it and you know it'll come and it'll be practical steps I'd need to take to be the best that I can be. Um, but I think you need the dream in the first place. I think too many yeah. people, either with their kids or on their own, they don't allow themselves to have that big dream. And I reckon without dreaming of being world number one or dreaming of you know winning a grand slam or whatever you probably wouldn't do it you wouldn't have got here without well, no, the dream. but i think it, it is dreams that that actually i think also give us a, a roadmap essentially for what our passions are it's 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 what do you see yourself doing what what do you imagine and, and, it, and it can change it's not everyone who dreams of being an astronaut becomes an astronaut and, and things evolve but it gives you ideas and i think that's what you from childhood you kind of take into adult life of okay what what are my passions what what kind of brings light into my life light so yeah no i think dreams are very important so how important is perseverance then to go with those dreams? Because no tennis player gets to where you have in a linear way. There's there's low times as well. So can you talk to us about perseverance? Oh, perseverance. I mean, I think perseverance is, I would say generally an asset, but I think sometimes it's also doesn't help as well, depending um, on kind of where you are in your career. For, I mean, for me, I... I persevered, I'd say 95% of the time because I just, I knew that this was what I was meant to do mm -hmm. and what I was, I was destined to do, born to do kind of, I, I was going to make it. Um, but then 5%, I think is persevering because you don't know what else to do. Okay. You don't know what life is outside what you've done for the last 10, 15, 20 years. So I think you don't always choose perseverance. I do think sometimes it chooses you or it's easier to just stay and just keep doing it. Um, but I'd, yeah, I think that's probably perseverance for me. It's not that inspiring. It's a bit depressing. <laughs> but so, it's vital though, isn't it? Yeah. So, so how do you come now to realise that sometimes you might be flogging a dead horse or you might be persevering on the wrong endeavour or the wrong task? How... Well, basically, how do you make that distinction? I think through time and experience. Um, I mean, I think through my career, especially until I'd 
became kind of what is, I guess, in mainstream known as successful um, in 2015. I mean, I had every reason to quit. I mean, I was, uh, in 2015, I was 20, turning 24 years old. I'd made it a little bit to about 80, um, but I was generally um, ranked between 100 and 200, about around the 150 mark. I wasn't making a living. I, um, you know, I, I, it was, there was, I guess, no big reason for me to keep going. Um, so I think there it was, I think, more the dream yeah. and more the perseverance together. How close together. did you come to knocking it all on the head? Um, not close. Just because every time it came into question of, okay, should I stop? Or I don't actually always didn't even come into question because I just... I remember distinctly crying on my bed with my mum there. And I mean, it sounds so embarrassing to say, but I just remember just telling her, like, I just know that I'm meant to be famous. I just know that I'm meant to be known and and yeah. and be 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 one of the best at what I do. And I just it was like I think that childhood probably like child was probably crying as an adult of like why isn't that happening for me? Um, so it never actually was an option for me within myself. And what did your mom say? In that conversation, I can't remember. Right. I can't too busy remember. Sobbing and I think I was too busy crying. just crying. Yeah, literally, I can't remember. I think. But it, generally, were you encouraged, or was there anyone ever saying to you, "Well, maybe you should start thinking about you're 24 now, maybe life beyond tennis"? Um, no, I'd say I was always encouraged. I'd say I was encouraged to decide for myself. I think. Um, yeah, I definitely was never told to keep going or told to stop. I think it was always there of, what do you want to do? Um, and so I just kept trying. <laughs> and do you think you were upset because you were trying to live up to the expectation that that eight-year-old girl had of, well, you're going to be world number one and lift all these trophies and there you are at 24 and it hasn't happened. So you're... Um, I think not so much about the dream. I think by then the dream is also muddled with all the sacrifices that comes along the way, not just my own, my parents, um, my parents left their lives in, in Australia. They racked up a load of debt moving over during the financial crisis while they both lost their jobs. Like it was, it was a whole family dynamic of sacrifice and knowing that having, for me, I felt personally responsible for that. And so I think it was trying to deal with my dream and what I hadn't yet achieved, yeah. coupled with, well, we're also in this state because of me and what what we decided to do for me. So I think it's it was kind of all of it together more than anything. It's a real reminder, isn't it, that when someone walks onto a tennis court or when any professional athlete competes in their chosen sport, look at all the things you carry at that moment you carry the thoughts of the eight-year-old, you carry the sacrifices of your parents, the hopes of your grandparents and your friends who you know are watching on screen back home. So how do you channel all of that and block all of that out and just make your... Because it's not healthy. You don't play better tennis for all that baggage. You play worse, don't you? So what's no. the answer to, to dealing with that? Um, well, I think that's where I got very lucky. Um, I got very lucky because that's when I was introduced to Juan Cotto. Yep. And um, through him and my coach at the time, Esteban Carril, and uh, it, it was during that period that we started to peel back the layers of, of anxiety, of, of um, responsibility, of, of, of guilt. I think guilt is probably the biggest one. Um, and start finding the root of why I play. And, and that's when I think the dream came back into it. That's where kind of I play because I fell in love with this sport as a young girl and I decided to dedicate my life to it. And whether I make it, I'm, you know, using quotation marks, whether I make it or not, um, it's actually irrelevant to that part because I, you know, I'm here and I, I, I'm trying to do the best that I can. 
And I think taking a lot of joy and pride in me doing the best that I can, I think that's what started then alleviating the guilt and and that side and actually started making room to become a better tennis player, to become a better competitor, to study the game, to learn the game, to to actually maximize what I have as a as a as an athlete. So would you say that you then started to love winning as opposed to fear losing as the as the big driver? Was that a distinction that you began to make? I think so, but I think more than anything, I just started to love playing. And I started to re actually almost fall in love again with with the sport, with the different things it, 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 it offered me, um, a, an outlet of my competitiveness, of my curiosity to improve my desire to learn. And I started enjoying that process. I think process became a very big trigger word for us. It was about the day in, day out process in, and, and yeah, enjoying that that process. <laughs> so had you, had you worked with anyone from a psychological perspective before you met Juan? Yeah, I think um, kind of through the Australian Federation at the time, and even maybe come when I came over, I'm sure I'd I'd met with someone at the at the LTA as well. I think psychology and sports psychology has always kind of been around um, for me. Um, I think I came at the point where it started becoming more popular, but I think it was more in yeah, it was when I met Juan where I actually I found someone. Um, who just spoke to me in a way that I understood and I could grasp and I could use practically. So could you give me an example of that then, Jo? Um, so it was kind of with him that we started first establishing a routine as well um, and accountability for the the things that I was doing. So we'd, I'd, I remember I'd always read every morning the Optimist's Creed Um and if probably pushed hard enough, I probably could recite it still because I read that Come on, for give years. Us a bit. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, and it would be um, things like that's when I I, I started using the um, Headspace, yeah, um, the app Headspace, and that and kind of getting a practice into that. And then it was, um, then I think it was also working through different worries. So I'd start, I'd start. That's when I started writing, so writing down kind of what I was stressed about, and then there was a formula to that in, in writing, writing down what I was struggling with, um, bringing all the reasons in why that was okay, why that was normal, then bringing all the reasons in why it could be grateful and, and why every, actually everything's okay. And it's almost like a, a game plan for yourself with whatever you're struggling with on that day. And it was this kind of habit that we built. And I think that started, again, uh, creating space for me to then play when it came to on court. So we get a lot of people talking to us about the struggle of anxiety and the baggage that they carry. And it, it seems to me like Juan kind of unpicked a lot of things from the past and realigned things in your mind. But almost more than that, it sounds like he kind of said, look, it's okay to have anxiety and struggle and fear and to carry all of this. But you can also carry it without being impacted by it. You can... You can live with it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it was it was understanding that actually whatever feelings that I'm feeling, whatever, um, however overwhelmed I feel, I'm actually fully equipped to deal with it. I'm fully equipped to live through it. And I think it was with him that it, we, we also discussed that nothing's permanent. Nothing's a permanent state. It, everything keeps moving. And so I think that kind of gave me hope as well when I was feeling really down or overwhelmed, stressed, upset, anything, um, knowing that this is not going to stay like this. I, I will feel different at some point. And I think actually, um, let me just get it right in my head, but a formula that he gave me is um, pain times resistance equals suffering. So if I'm in pain, let's say at a 10, but and I'm you know resisting at a 10, my suffering's gonna be 100. Yeah. But if my resistance is zero, then my suffering's zero. And although, you know, there's probably variances in there, but to me that gave it a very practical, tangible kind of Brilliant. kind of steps for me to take if I was feeling a certain way. So when did you see the evidence of this work that you were doing, the habit, some of the reflections that you were doing? When did you start to see some of the seeds of that begin to blossom? 
Um, I think... I think probably in 2015, I was playing a small challenger circuit. I was also working with a, a coach who worked with Esteban called Jose Manuel Garcia, and he would sometimes come on trips with me. And we were together in um, the US playing on green clay. Um, it was the kind of the prep circuit on the ITF tour for French Open. And we were playing 25s, 25s and maybe a $50,000 tournament in... Jackson, Mississippi, and in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, yeah. and Dothan, Alabama, I think the place was called. And I remember just playing that whole trip, just really grateful and really just kind of in a, yeah, in a very sincerely grateful way of just being able to be there and just to be able to step on court and being healthy and enjoying the sunshine and and just really looking at these you know lovely little like clubs that we were playing at like how great is this how and I think that's when I really felt like I took just a, a like a really big breath and just kind of oh this is really great and if it never changes from this if this is if this is all I get in in kind of the hierarchy of tennis then my god I'm so lucky and I think it was that kind of just real deep appreciation for kind of what I was doing just it it just brought me joy it just it it, it really I, I just started being very happy um and that was actually to be fair not too long before I'd I then qualified for the first time at the French Open and it was then that kind of back end of that summer that I I went on a, a decent winning streak. I won the 100K in Vancouver and then qualified and made second round, second week of So then the when US. you started going to the big Opens and the French Open, yeah. how much did you manage to still retain that that uh, that attitude of gratitude, that, that appreciation of what you were experiencing there? I think I still managed to to bring that. I think, I think through a bit of naivety as well. Um, I didn't, I'd, I'd never really experience, experienced the big tournaments, big stages. I played, you know, a, a couple rounds here and I'd qualified once before at the U S open. So I dabbled, I'd say, but I, I wasn't, it wasn't my routine stomping ground. It wasn't kind of my, my week in week yeah. out. So I, I, I went into those tournaments feeling very trusting of of the team that I had I felt very grateful for the people that I had around me and I think that definitely gave me a lot of strength at that time when I maybe didn't have my own to draw from as much um but yeah no I I I think I I I did but maybe a little bit cautiously a bit nervously kind of oh this is me yeah. but, but it's okay like this like so kind of almost like not not fully like opening myself oh this is amazing kind of thing to that bit I think that came what well, comes also with time I think on different stages yeah <laughs> and I assume that Juan actually was really helpful for you then away from tennis because what he hasn't done is told you how to play a better backhand or how to be better at the net this is these are life lessons that he was really giving you. No, exactly. Um, and it wasn't just even for me. It was at the time he was also doing, he was doing work with my parents. Uh, I think it was to understand the dynamic of kind of a whole mindset and whole whole kind of, you know, struggles. It's, it's, it's also in the family. It's, 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 I wasn't the only one on that journey. My parents were as well and they had their own you know, things that, that, that they struggled with or, or they needed to understand. And, and I know he helped them a lot in in perspective and, and kind of also understanding what I was going through. So he, it was, it was a very nurturing environment. It was very holistic. It, it wasn't about performance. It was about living. It was about being a rounded human being. And I suppose in some ways it does, it's, you know, I know of course all that really matters is winning games of tennis, but actually when he improves that side of your life, it takes the pressure off the results because you're not getting your happiness from winning games of tennis anymore. He's teaching you the tools for 
happiness, whatever the situation, whatever the tournament, whatever the result. No, exactly. It was it was life lessons. It was it was about teaching me to to yeah find joy in my life regardless of tennis because there is going to be a life after tennis as well and that's actually a lot longer hopefully knock on wood <laughs> than than life before and i think it was it was just that understanding of me as a human being is actually it, that is what make what gives me a chance to be a tennis player but that that is actually who you have to nurture to give the tennis player even a chance so we get lots of parents listening to this podcast then, Joe. So what what was the big difference you noticed in your parents when they started to receive this advice? I think kind of like me, I think there was a period where they also just kind of took a deep breath as well. Um you know, it's a very, it's a very high stress environment where everyone's really trying so hard to achieve one goal. And it's kind of like giving, they also, I think, found a way to give themselves some space from how I was doing or, you know, my tennis. And they kind of, I think they saw the people that I was surrounded by and they chose to trust them. And they, I think that gave them some peace as well, some peace and quiet probably within themselves as well. Um, but I think, yeah, it was it was just that perspective and deep breath and perspective is actually really a really useful tool. <laughs> so, so take me into like the dynamic of 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 say after a loss or a defeat, how did your parents then start to treat you um, in those moments? I think it started becoming um, more about the effort again, more about did I try my best. I did. Well, then we, we keep going. We keep trying. Um, and less about judgment, right. um, more about opportunity. I think less about um, less about kind of insecurities, more about um, kind of a plan and then and, and knowing what we're working on and, and kind of seeing seeing the progress in little things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, they bought into the whole process of, of learning and, and becoming better and trusted that if it was going to give me success, it will, and, and give that time. Cause that's powerful because you hear a lot of, and uh, like horror stories of some of the parents of young prodigies on, uh, on the tennis circuit of, that have, that have sacrificed everything like your parents did, but then become fixated on the outcome. And so how did that help you, the fact that your parents then started to to engage in the process rather than worrying about the outcome? Um, I mean, I think quite frankly, if, if they didn't go on that journey with me, I probably wouldn't have been able to make it because I needed their help and their guidance for me to be able to do it as well because we, we were in this together and, and it was... I was 24, but I was very young. I was, you know, I'd I'd only ever lived at home, albeit I, you know, I traveled the world a lot, and so, you know, it was still at the kind of end stages of me growing up and starting to become more of an adult. But it's kind of we needed to do this together for us to have a better relationship, kind of on the court to do with tennis, but also off it. So I, yeah, I couldn't have done it without them also committing to it. And they wouldn't have been able to do that without the help of Juan Cotto. Um, and the real tragedy here for people that are listening to this that don't know the story of your relationship with Juan was that he sadly took his own life. And I, I wonder how difficult that was for you personally because when someone's giving you life advice, you look at them and think, wow, I, if only I was as sorted as you are, if only if I knew all the things that you know, I would have had a very different path to here. Um, you know, but it's hard to know what to ask, really. But that is a very hard thing for you to compute, I'd imagine. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting. I think, I think actually, people that give the best advice and and actually really understand something is because they have personal experience, mm-hmm. and. I knew that he had struggled with his own his own thoughts and his own his own emotional mental well being before, and he'd spoken about that with me. Um, and and I think it was kind of that journey for himself that he 
he saw the power in 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 thinking in the mind in 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 emotion and i think you know i mean how incredibly passionate he was about helping people i think the two together made into an incredible human being and you know it, yeah i mean yeah no i yeah no, he was amazing yeah i bet and the, i suppose the irony is without his own personal struggles he wouldn't have been in the position to help people like you and to transform people's lives and you know we've all we've all lost people close to us i think that perhaps the lessons that he gave you live longer and live stronger for the fact that he's no longer here to to see them um you know i mean i'd i'd love if he was still here i think the lessons would still be just as strong but um for reasons you know we don't know life turned out the way it did and um but i know that he he would he would be very proud in in i think knowing that the things that he was teaching people not just myself but he touched a lot of people's lives are still giving guidance and and bringing joy to people and and i think he i think that would make him very happy and you work hard to remember the things he taught you because we had a guest on called uh, Joe Malone, who created the perfume brand. She had a cancer diagnosis, and she said that when she had the diagnosis, she she was going to change the way she lived. And then after she recovered, she found that the lessons, which she said, slipped through my fingers like sand, and she couldn't catch them anymore. What do you do now to remember the lessons that Juan taught you to make sure that they don't slip through your fingers? Well, I think because of the way he he taught me and the way he guided me it was a very practical way it was me doing the work it was it was routine and and because i figured it out for myself in the end with his help actually the biggest gift that he gave is that the work is mine the the result is mine the the experience is mine and therefore i can i always have the ability to think back on it and create space to really, okay, what did I, what what have I learnt? And that's the gift he gave me. It's actually, he didn't do it for me. He guided me in a way that I could do it for myself. And that means that it's a part of me and it, it's not something that I'll lose. It's so, yeah, I think it was kind of that. <laughs> so can I ask a question that I've asked a number of guests on this? of how much improvement, if you had to put a figure on it, do you think working on the psychology and the mental side of your sport gave you? Um, I think for me, it was a massive part because for me, I think I'd, I was always relatively gifted as an athlete. I've got a good physique for what I do. I've, I've got good genes in that sense. You know, I, 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 I think I have a, I have the ability to work hard. I, so, I had fundamentals that could make me a good athlete, could make me a good tennis player, um, and I think that got me to a certain point. Um, but I think without that mental aspect on 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 just helping me to deal with my own crap really yeah. <laughs> without that opportunity I, I don't think I would have I would have gone from A to B I think I would have been stuck where I was so when you're now at the big opens and things like that I imagine that most people have got a similar level of fitness strength the, their technique is relatively similar how much then do you think the mental side of tennis decides who gets into those later rounds? I think it's a combination. I think it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's a big part of what we do. It's a big part of our sport, of most sports. Um, but our matches can be long. It, it's a bit of chess. It's a bit of, so, you know, 100%, I think it's, it's a part of, but I think it's the mental side is kind of like, a forehand or a backhand it's an it's another part that everyone's looking to maximize and everyone is becoming more and more self-aware knowing their triggers or knowing um kind of okay how do i react in these situations okay what's what thoughts can i think on to help me kind of stay 
stay in the moment, stay, stay grounded, stay present, kind of everyone's starting to become aware. So it's actually becoming less of a factor okay. just because I think more people are aware of it. So it starts becoming the one Intr- yeah, percent yeah, yeah, in, in kind of it's it's starting to become another shot essentially, I yeah. think. It's a good point out though, when not many people are doing it, focusing on the mental side of something is really valuable. It's revolutionary. <laughs> when everyone's that. doing it, you have to be extra good at that to be any better, don't you? But then the reason that I asked that question is because I I I read the quote that said that that you didn't have huge levels of emotional control in those early days. You didn't almost have a plan B when times got tough. So how do you spot now that maybe you're starting to lose emotional control that could potentially cost you a game or that you need to change uh, a game plan? Um, oh, I, I mean, I think now it's, it's, it's knowing myself better. I think, I think part of, I guess, emo- losing emotional control or, I think a part of that is also immaturity. Do you agree um, with those? Not necessarily, by the way? not fully. Yeah. Um, just because I think a lot of it is context. A lot of it is is also it's understanding what's going on, and and you know people lose their shit kind of every, every every day in different walks of life, and the only thing that's different is being in a heightened state yeah. in front of loads of people. It becomes kind of that much more like whoa. She's really kind of lost her head. Um, and it's not always the case, I think. Um, I, I I don't like it when I think, you know, you hear these hyperbolic words of like kind of they've completely lost control. They're, you know, they're, they're out of it or, you know, let things happen, let things move. Um, but for sure, for me personally, I needed to find a space where I could channel and could start re reorganizing my thoughts when I became stressed or when I became so-called emotional. So how do you do that then? Um, perspective. Um, that's where actually perspective became a big part of actively doing it during matches. It was kind of taking a step back and seeing the sun shining. My family loves me. I'm out here. I'm getting a good tan. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, staying physically fit. I, I get to do something that I love. What's the problem? And you'll run through that in your head, will you, during the match, in between a more serve so, or in between yeah, a set so or whatever? Then, yeah. I think less so now, just because it, I think it's maybe become a little bit more oiled, a little bit easier. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, then I would. I would actually just really go through different things like just kind of gratefulness and perspective. So do you remember a few years ago when Andy Murray brought out a letter that he'd written to himself of all his strengths and oh, characteristics I, I and I people do, yeah. saw that? Do you have anything like that, any props or anything to help you trigger that that sense of perspective? No, no, but back actually, back in 2016 in um, at the Australian Open at the time, uh, at the top of tennis rackets on the top of the grip there's that little band that kind of holds the sticky tape in place that holds the grip kind of in place and um i i got to have like different type different colors of that little kind of band thing and it had different words on there and it had like play it had love it had power it had um focus and actually that to me really i really enjoyed and i would purposely choose a different one for each match that i played at the australian open that year and i kind of would look at it sometimes and think you know what i i can practice like this is something i can use like i just kind of so i don't know if that answers your question but i just remember that kind of felt like perfect yeah it's actually a good reminder that you know people think that to change your mindset or to get control of your brain is a really big job and it's nigh on impossible. The reality is it can be something as simple as looking at a colour, looking at a word, looking at the sunshine, thinking yeah. about your parents. You know, little things can yeah. have such a huge impact, can't they? No, I think so. And I think, it, you know, it's again coming back to that realisation that whatever difficulty you're facing, whatever um, heaviness you have, it's not permanent. It can change. And actually all the tools that you need are within you or in your environment. And it can be sight, sounds, smells, your own kind of feel like, you know, you have the ability to 
to live through it and and to to go through it and and change it and yeah from my conversation i get the sense that one of your frustrations is people passing judgment on a match you've played or the way a match has gone i mean we have to accept we live in a world of no nuance right so you are either brilliant or awful there's nothing in between <laughs> let's just accept that that is the way the world works these days have you learned to not fight against um people casting judgment over what happened during a match when they have basically no idea what happened because they weren't out on the court or um do you just accept it now how, how, how do you deal with those things do you fight them um no i i i don't i i understand what it is and and the place it has i think as a as a logical person i get that i think when it becomes difficult is when you're tired when you're feeling vulnerable when you're feeling sad that's when that's when it's harder to do it's harder to practice that practical mind and that's when that's when it can affect you that's when it can kind of creep in and and kind of jab you a little bit and 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 that's when you take it on um so yes i i know how to deal with it and and i get it do does it always happen that i i deal with it that way no sometimes i i get upset by it sometimes i cry about the injustice of it sometimes um or sometimes i don't care sometimes yeah. it's fine sometimes well everyone's entitled to their opinion but sometimes it's how dare they have that opinion so you know i think it's also on what state you're in and kind of how much things are affecting you but again perspective <laughs> yeah so yeah what, that, what are the questions so as, as you probably know i work you know as a sports presenter like what are the questions or what are the things that we should be doing when it comes to people like you that educate the audience better rather than just guessing that you've lost your shit or you've you know you've mentally collapsed or whatever what should we be asking people like you to really understand what goes on in in games and in events um, I think it's individual, but I think it's more listening to what we say. I think for me, it's is you know I I actually do try consciously to give an insight and to to not just for the journalists, but for the people who are reading the pieces. And I I do try to actually get my personality across, my my beliefs across, my thought process across, like kind of what who am I as a player, who am I as a person. And I think I think what's more most frustrating maybe is when the answer you give they don't like or they want something different. And it's more the case of, well, I can't give you anything different because this is who I am. And so work with me then because I can't I can't be anything other than me. And I think it's I think it's more that that's for me is where, where my frustration more comes from is I'm trying to I'm trying to let you know who I am you know, play ball with me here. Um, because I, I like talking. I like sharing my experiences. I, I've been very open in, in the work that I've done with Juan, with, 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 you know, people in the past, especially on the mental side. And I think I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have any hangups about sharing. Well, there's eight-year-old Johanna Contas living somewhere in the world, dreaming of being the world number one. So <laughs> the lessons that you can share, you know, are only a good thing. It's been a really interesting sort of journey to go from running up hills with your dad, to leaving home, to crying with your mum because your career wasn't going the way you wanted, to having your eyes opened by Juan, to actually the fact that the power is all yours. And then we get to the point where suddenly, like, you're in the top five best tennis players in the world and you are the British number one and you are in that place that you dreamed of as a little kid, carrying the hopes of an entire nation at Wimbledon. Was it all you hoped it would be? Um, oh, uh, yes and no. Yes, it is lots of people around you. Yes, it is um, exciting. But actually you go home and it's very normal. Yeah. So it's not, it's not everything you thought it would be it's actually a lot better because it's just your life and it's normal and it's nothing actually changes. And I remember actually in 2017, because I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, I remember playing the tour of the matches and I remember feeling nervous or stressed or it was difficult. And I remember kind of, you know, looking up in the stands and 
just looking at my boyfriend there and thinking, well, actually, after this, we'll go home and you'll still love me and whatever happens here. And, and you know, it was kind of that normality of, of kind of being with that. And I think that's why it's actually so much better than what you dream of. For me, it was anyway, just because it's just normal. <laughs> and that's when you were playing some of your best ever tennis. So it shows that you don't have to be struggling. Johnny Wilkinson spoke on this podcast about he thought that struggling would lead to success and he realised that struggling just leads to more struggling. And yes. this is really interesting. That just as you were at the absolute peak, you weren't having to struggle. You were kind of free. Yeah. No, I think I was. And I think actually my, I would call it my biggest year of freedom probably was in 2019. Um, and that's when I started working with Dimitri Zabielov and he's been an incredible influence on my life. And the you know, perspectives than he started bringing into then my tennis and kind of, again, giving me the kind of the, the control of how do you want to play? What do you want to do out there? Kind of the, what choices do you want to make and trust those choices there, you know, that if they don't pay dividends, then who knows in how, how they pay dividends in other parts of the match. It was kind of understanding that, you know, there's no right or wrong. There's, there's, you know, things again keep moving, but yeah, and actually that year I played, I played very free that year. So what you're describing there, what Dimitri is doing is the idea of guided discovery that is allowing you to answer the questions. He's just posing them, which sounds obvious in many ways. How common is that approach within your world? I think it's very uncommon. Uncommon. Uh, I'd say it's uncommon um, because it, because it takes trust and faith in in I think a path less kind of walked less discovered you know there's there's still a lot of a lot of success and a lot of a, a lot of good things in in the kind of you do what you're told you know there's a lot of good co coaches out there who who've worked with a lot of great players who together they've they've done that but I I don't function like that and I think it's all very individual so for me this kind of work, this way of working is actually, I, th I think the only way I can perform, I can bring the best out of myself. So for me, it was very important, but no, it's not common. Oh, because it sounds very similar to the approach that your dad took when you first declared that you wanted to get up at five o'clock in the morning yes. and run, that you're, you're dictating the terms and yeah. conditions rather than somebody's got a stick and beating you to get yeah, out there. And, I, and who knows, maybe there's, there's, you know, there's some subconscious kind of way of that's how I was wired when I was young. So maybe that's why that kind of working as an adult works for me. I don't know, but I didn't think of that. So yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> See, it all comes back. All comes to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose I'm kind of thinking that the Joanna, Johan Conte that's sitting in front of us today is so different to the 21, 22 year old who was totally outcome focused. Yeah. You're probably realizing now that actually the outcome is, is, is the journey, not the outcome, right? Yeah, no, 100%. And I think that was actually one of the biggest things that I, I wrote always consistently is I, I, you know, I'm committed to the process. I'm enjoying the process and, and the outcome will be what it will be. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's kind of here. And I think actually my fitness trainer said this and I probably won't use the, ex I can't remember the exact words, but it was basically along the lines of, you know, there's winning and losing and the highs and the lows, but actually then there's living, mm. you know, we live every day and, and it's, it's make that living purposeful and enjoyable. And, and you want to come to work with the people that you enjoy working with and, because you know, winning, losing, it's kind of here, there. It's it's high, it's low, it's, but in between all that, there's actually just living every day. And is that quite scary when you've spent a whole life being focused on on the goal, on the outcome? Someone actually saying to you, no, 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 let's not think about winning the tournament. Let's just think about enjoying playing in the tournament. It, because whether it's a CEO or a teacher or a parent listening to this, to shift their mindset away from the the result is. I think it's scary. Yes, but actually to me it was liberating. Um, I needed it. I think I was starved for it. I needed, because I was doing it one way and 
it wasn't making me happy. It wasn't making me successful. It, it, it was actually making me downright miserable. It was making my parents miserable. Like it was, it, it wasn't working. So actually what was the harm for me? For me it was, why not? And, and I just took to it because I, I, I understood it. I understood it very quickly and I could see it like kind of what joy could bring me. And then, Hey, I'm happy. Why, you know, what's there to, to kind of complain about. (laughs) So can you tell us about the transferability of, of that mindset to, uh, so I know, for example, that you're doing university studies and you're almost preparing for. Not quite. I mean, I I wish I, I wish I was at Harvard. No, that's not quite what it is. Oh, go on, explain (laughs) it. I saw the Harvard. I know, I know. I mean, go with it. I should have have my Harvard jumper. Just, (laughs) um, no. So basically we, we, we're very fortunate that at Harvard, they do this kind of, um, crossover into business program and it's it's in conjunction with a bunch of athletes from a bunch of different leagues from the NBA from kind of yeah from the NFL from literally Chris Bosch one of our guests was on who is on that program as well and did he say he went to Harvard no he didn't he He did it too bad he did it (laughs) Um, and basically yeah they they pick a load of athletes kind of every semester and they have their current MBA students or just graduate um, MBA students kind of pair up and mentor an athlete each. And they take us through all their case studies that they do in business school. Um, and so it was kind of just learning on how they learn and what they study, um, learning different cases to do with um, the business of sport, you know, management, entertainment, um, kind of and how, you know, how you know, I guess people make money more than anything. I think it was mainly. Um, And yeah, I mean, it was an unbelievable experience just to, to kind of interact with, they were uh, my mentors. I got a group of three guys. Um, They are just graduating actually the, the MBA. Um, yeah, no, it was amazing. I mean, I didn't go to Harvard. Ah, right, okay. I didn't but, go to Harvard. Okay, uh, well, my original question stands then, but we'll, we'll edit that bit out of, yeah. of, 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 of How transferable is your mindset, though, about letting go of the result and focusing on the process to a world outside of tennis? Um, I think it's completely transferable because I've used it in different things. So, you know, for me, getting used to even this, for example, you know, I probably would get more nervous before than I would now, um, just because I understand that I will come here, I will do the best that I can, and I will, I will enjoy speaking to you both, and the result will be what it will be, and I will keep my fingers crossed that, you know, I give you guys a good episode, but at the end of the day, I can only be myself, and I can only do the best that I can, so I think it's that, that you can apply in, in anything. And I was actually the other day, I, I just did um, Sunday brunch and I was really nervous before going on. I, I, I don't know why, but I felt very, very nervous. And again, it's just that same process of, okay, I'm here. I'm on time. I've, I've done everything that I can. I will go out there. I'll be kind. I'll be happy. And We'll see what happens. <laughs> I think this episode will be okay, don't you? I think it'll be exceptional. <laughs> bit of don't worry. Bit. <laughs> um, we've reached the point of our quick fire questions okay. that we always finish the podcast with. Um, first of all, the three non negotiable behaviors that you and the people around you have to buy into. Non negotiable. So it's that things we don't want them to do. Things they have to do. The non negotiable. Oh, they oh, they're non Okay, they these have to do. Can't, yeah, you have to bring um, these to the table. Respectful. Um, so, yeah, respect. Um, respect. What's the word? Um, truthfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, I think being honest, honesty. That's yeah. the word. Honesty. And communication. To communicate. What advice would you give to a teenage Johanna just starting out? Oh, um, I'd say I I wish I learned earlier on to just be grateful and be patient and and look at the world more broadly, look at my career more broadly. I think you know it's very narrow, it's very all all encompassing kind of 
stop and smell the roses kind of thing. Yeah. Lovely. Stop and smell the roses. Very good. <laughs> Have you got one book recommendation for our high performance family to to listen to? Yes, and I've even got the name and author for you. <laughs> Go for it. It's uh, Winning Not Fighting. No, yeah, Winning Not Fighting by John Vincent. <laughs> Excellent. Why why does that book work for you? Um, I actually just started it to be honest and I'm just really interested in in reading kind of the philosophy that I've bought into but a different take on it. Um, because it's not maybe quite word for word what I kind of maybe learned, but it's definitely along the same lines or, or certain bits that I've read, for, like they are definitely. So it's it's just nice to hear how someone else has also practically used it in their life. Very good. And finally, what's your one golden rule for a high performance life? One golden rule for high performance life. Um, I think... Practicing joy, practicing gratefulness. Um, I think that gives you the chance to be your best self and therefore your best chance of being successful. Brilliant. And there is one more. This is the final, final yes. question. What is your biggest strength and what is your biggest weakness? My biggest strength, I, whew, I don't know how about myself. Uh, my biggest strength is um, I laugh a lot. I think uh, I think that's that's helped me in a lot of different things. Um, my biggest weakness um, is probably being able to take a break. I that's taken some time for me to know kind of when to apply myself, but when to also kind of take a bit of space, nurture myself, take some time off. Um, that's something that I've I've had to learn and continue to learn. Brilliant. Look. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this podcast thank you. Um, and especially for opening up and talking to us about one which I, I know wouldn't have been um, very easy for you but I think that like to get from the eight-year-old to being a professional tennis player right you had to be all in you kind of at that point you had to totally be all about the outcome um, and I think what's been really powerful in this conversation is sharing us sharing with us the journey from being outcome focused to process focused and it's worked for you in a tennis sense, but I really hope that for everyone listening to this, it works for them in the sense of their own lives as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. <laughs> Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure. <laughs>